Good morning, this is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. We're broadcasting from the Dolph Simons Family Studio here in the health system. I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Hawkeye, Doc Hawk, all sorts of other things we have, mm -hmm. as well as Senator Jerry Moran and the Secretary of KDHE, Lee Norman. So, D Senator Moran, how are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. I'm fine, thank you. Always a are you, are you sheltering in your basement again today, sir? Uh, live once again from the basement in Manhattan, Kansas. Yes, sir. Excellent. Good place to be. And, and Secretary Norman, did you get any sleep last night after the governor's address? <laughs> well, I've got as much sleep last night as I've gotten every other night since January 7th. <laughs> okay, so not much, not often. I don't know how that feels. All right, so I'm going to first turn to Dana. Dana, how are we doing this morning? Hi, hi, we're good. You know, again, I think we've, again, continued to be in this sort of new baseline. We flattened the curve. The curve is right there at right. 28 or what, 23. I mean, we're right yep, in that range. Yep, again. we are. We are uh, 26, so you're right. Um, half of those are in the ICU, though. So, you know, we still are getting sick people, critical illness. Um, we have had discharges recently as well, so that's a good thing. And hopefully we are holding steady and we will continue to have lower amounts and hopefully eventually, you know, no amounts, obviously we would like that. But, but right now we are at our curtain baseline. We are doing well for PPE. We are doing well for rooms and ventilators. Um, if we can just make sure that we don't have a large surge now when, when some of this new, new stuff starts taking place in the next couple weeks, that'll be a great thing. Yeah. So, um, Secretary Norman, anything? Uh, just kind of an opening thoughts from from you today, and I and acknowledging I know you have a hard stop today at eight thirty. Yeah, yeah, we have incident command at eight thirty, and that's kind of a, a must uh, uh, attend. Um, you know, a couple things. One is that the trend line statewide for uh, on the three key indicators we're watching is a death rate per. Uh, per capita, the hospitalizations per capita, and then the prevalence of the disease per capita uh, are all improving. Um, it, it's the last one that I mentioned in the amount of disease is a little bit tough to understand by a lot of people because of the fact that we're doing so much more testing. We're finding more um, illness, of course, um, and um, and yet we. It looks to us like from our epidemiologic data statewide that we peaked out on about the 17th or 18th of. April, which is curiously about the date we had forecasted that we would in um, as early as in March. So I think that the timing was fortuitous, um, and I was, I'm was i pleased with the um, plan that we have to gradually in phases open up the state. It's always controversial, and I'm sure we'll get people that think it's too liberal. I'm sure there's others that'll think it's too restrictive, um, but I I think that means that we're trying to be in the middle there uh, with a, a measure of caution. So it will depend highly on people exercising good judgment. Um, and yes, there's some rules in there, but mostly it allows us county by county because Kansas is a very diverse state. It allows the counties to have a certain measure of control as well. So I, I'd like to think that it's a, um, it, it's a balanced approach to phase in the uh, to whatever the new reality ends up looking like. Yeah, and I just think as a healthcare provider, I have to echo that and say I, I, I'm I'm proud to, to 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 work in Kansas because I think that we've done a good job and we we have bent the curve and Kansas City has done a great job of bending the curve and we just have to continue to follow those rules, especially about physical distancing, washing your hands, don't touch your face because even as we open things up, it doesn't mean the coronavirus went away. It's still right there in front of you and do the things that keep you safe. So, Senator, how are things going in D.C., and, and uh, how are things, uh, do you ever get out of the basement now, or, you, or does, uh, does your wife just kind of keep you there as a measure of safekeeping? Uh, doctor, it'd be unsafe for me to have this conversation. She'll hear this broadcast, and uh, I don't know what the correct, uh, the wifely uh, husband answer is to that question is supposed may, to be. You may have a very so slow I am, uh, I am in Kansas, although I leave for, uh, for Washington, D.C., um, on Monday, the Senate resumes its session uh, and uh, back to work in the nation's capital. I would say since we last visited last Friday, uh, things that uh, we've been focused on that uh, Moran has been working on. One, uh, we were successful uh, late last week in, in passing uh, PPP, 
this is the uh, issue that allows small businesses, less than 500 uh, employees, to access a small business loan guarantee. If they keep their em employees employed, that uh, loan can be in large part forgiven. That's thought of, I would guess, by most people as an economic issue. Like almost everything that we deal with in related to COVID-19, there's an economic and healthcare aspect to, to each and every item. In this case, it allows people to continue to receive their paycheck, even though because of COVID-19, either themselves or family members being affected, they can uh, can stay at home and not go to the workplace and can uh, still receive their paycheck. That is a healthcare issue. Certainly keeping businesses open and people employed generally uh, is an economic issue. And those two come together very well in this program. What we did was restore the, the, the first phase of that money disappeared in a matter of uh, days, weeks. Uh, and now that was restocked uh, with the, the Small Business Administration and our local lenders beginning making loans this Monday. Challenges uh, are still there with the computer and the magnitude of what uh, we're asking the SBA and and lenders to do, but it is uh, it is a program that has been popular and working. Uh, secondly, uh, that program did not allow it. Initially, I mean, the language is that it allows hospitals, less than 500 employees, to qualify for that. In many communities across Kansas, uh, our hospitals happen to be our largest employers, and yet they could not access that uh, fund, that program, if they were a political subdivision, meaning a county, city, or district hospital, even though you had less than 500, the way the legislation was originally worded or, or interpreted, uh, it was, did not allow them because they were considered a political subdivision. We had success this week in getting the Treasury Department to uh, modify their interpretation. Uh, and now, in most instances, uh, hospitals, regardless of whether they're county, city, or district, can qualify. I noticed uh, that uh, other hospitals larger than 500 are now uh uh, agitating, I don't know if that's a good word, uh, encouraging that that be expanded to larger businesses uh, and hospitals, more than 500. But we are, it, it's a step in taking care of those small hospitals, just like the University of Kansas Health System, in which the revenues are way down and the expenses are up, and uh, we need uh, hospitals across our state. And then mostly, uh, I would say, well, then, then there was the, the, the second tranche of money coming to, to hospitals. So early on, $100 billion was set aside to assist hospitals uh, outside certainly this PPP program. And it, uh, that money was uh, delivered now twice, first in a, in a set of dollars of $30 billion, now in a second set of $20 billion. Uh, and the first set was mostly based upon reimbursing hospitals based upon Medicare uh, payments to those hospitals. The second more on Medicaid payments, so it affected each hospital differently. And, uh, for example, uh, the neighbor down the street, uh, Children's Mercy, would qualify in a much better way under Medicaid, not under Medicare. So it affects each hospital differently, but, again, a resource for providing the necessary resources for all of you to do your work. And then perhaps most importantly, uh, my week has been involved in trying to find more tests for Kansans to give Lee Norman more tools, to give KU Health System more tools to care for their patients, for our public health departments to be able to uh, do more broad scale testing. A lot of that has focused on uh, the meat packing industry, uh, a huge component of the Kansas economy. It's uh, $10 billion of the Kansas economy, 18,000 employees. Uh, we process 30% uh, of the beef that's consumed in the country in Kansas. Uh, and that is uh, certainly an issue for, one might say, places that have a meat packing plant but the livestock sector is hugely impacted by lack of a market to take their livestock to for slaughter, and it has a consequence for consumers. So a bit of Kansas economy, again, tied with health care. How do we do everything we can to make sure that employees who work in meat processing, who work in food uh, supply, uh, that they are safe and that they uh, feel comfortable in that safety? Uh, the president issued an executive order which was useful in, uh, in liability and issues and highlighting this challenge to the country. In fact, I had called President Trump and asked him to return a call to me, which he did to talk about this issue, I don't know, 10, 12 days ago, maybe two weeks ago. And uh, so a step in the right direction, but the health of those workers is still paramount. No executive order can make them healthy. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, was in Kansas this week 
um, visiting those plants, uh, determining what safety measures had been taken, what safety measures needed to be taken further. And uh, it takes us back uh, to uh, what every conversation I have, it seems, uh, we need more testing. And uh, I appreciate the efforts of uh, Dr. Norman and, the, and our state officials. Uh, a federal government, I had a conversation with the head of the Domestic Policy Council. So we often hear about the National Security Council. The opposite of that at the White House is the Domestic Council, uh, D Domestic Policy Council. And the head of it is a guy named Joe Grogan. He and I conversed uh, last week. And the question was, what can, the, what can the White House, what can the Domestic uh, Policy Council do to get rid of the bottlenecks and get more tests to Kansas? And I noticed the governor announced uh, 25,000 more tests coming from the from the feds uh, this week. So uh, that's a bit of my report of uh, kind of what's transpired since we were together a week ago. And congratulations to all of you for your efforts in bending that curve and getting Kansas in a place in which we can begin the process of, of opening up uh, in a responsible way, Dr. Stites. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your great work. And always, it's a pleasure to have you on our, 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 uh, our program today. So let's turn to questions out there from our media friends and, and our media uh, colleagues and, and others, and, and, and uh, let's see if we can uh, hear some of those. Hey, Dr. Norman, this is Mike Sherry from Kent State Public Television. Um, um, Senator Moran mentioned the additional tests. Would you mind just giving us a snapshot of the amount of tests you have and also an update on the, the and maybe as far as the tests go, what, you're, what you need and, and an update on contact tracing? Yeah, happy to do that. Good question. The um, first off, we there's two kinds of people you test: um, the people that are ill as part of their man diagnosis and management of their disease. That's pretty self-intuitive. And then the second one is asymptomatic people, um, in order to understand how much disease is out there in the population. We have, uh, by necessity, been testing ill people for the most part, and really just over the last. Uh, because of the limitation of the testing materials. And the, the materials, it's everything from how you sample it with a swab all the way through how do you transport it with the viral medium, how do you uh, run it on what kind of a test platform. And uh, we haven't had, at each of those steps, haven't had a, enough of anything along the way. We, um, I think you may have seen we've ordered uh, and now have enough swabs. We commissioned our dentists in the state to use their 3D printers to make swabs. So we, that's not a limiting factor. We just this week got the first 50,000 uh, viral transport mediums. We've been making our own viral transport medium. Uh, we got the first 50,000 uh, through a commercial source, which will lead uh, ultimately to 500,000 viral transport media and swabs. And I think we're comfortable with that. As Senator Moran said, the floodgates are opening a bit uh, such that we anticipate getting 60,000 additional test kits from the federal government this month. Our goal is to test uh, 60,000, uh, and I think we'll, we'll reach that this month in Kansas. That, and they'll be both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. Uh, that will give us a prevalence so we have an, un an understanding. Do 2% of Kansans have the virus? That, 2% of Kansas at any given moment in time. We know we will continue to focus on uh, particularly restricted living situations like uh, skilled nursing, acute rehab centers, and prisons. We have very high incidence in the prisons, particularly in Lansing. Uh, we are doing asymptomatic testing there and, uh, and doing everything we can. It's hard to, to socially distance in a prison when you have bunk beds, for example. The, to the question of uh, contact tracing, we are bringing in 50 new people at a time with the goal to get to uh, 400 contact tracers. That's a minimum number that we feel we'll need as we go through the spring, summer, fall, winter. Uh, we've had 523 soldiers and airmen um, that have been dispatched, everything from hauling PPE to 105 counties to doing uh, to medics. And, and medical personnel doing testing in the prison. We've got down in southwest Kansas, as Senator Moran points out, a significant problem with the meatpacking plants. Um, and we have put a lot of resources. NIOSH has been in there helping us. Think of NIOSH as OSHA, uh, going in and helping them. And the companies have responded beautifully, I will tell you, in terms of engineering controls, plexiglass shields, et cetera. 
We have CDC in there uh, as well. Uh, so I think we've got a lot of boots on the ground uh, in Southwest Kansas. As of just this moment, we've in the four counties, three of which are in Southwest Kansas, Finney Ford and Seward, plus Lyon County, we've done 1,301 tests um, in those various plants, which is giving us a really good snapshot. And again, those have been mostly targeted towards people who are ill. Uh, last comment for, for now anyway, for me, um, the, the fact that the president declared um, the packing industries to be essential businesses as part of the food, uh, food chain for the United States helped us a lot. It kind of took the question off the table of um, do we want people to go to work? Do we want, we are not endorsing and are not expecting that ill people will work in, in the packing plants. Um, and it, but we need to have very aggressive testing and case management, or sorry, contact tracing in order to keep people out. We've hired, we've taken over some uh, contracted for hotels so that we, people will get, if they are put into quarantine, we'll have comfortable area to do that. And I think the cooperation has been good, but we remember that people work in the packing plants, but they also live in the community. So it's a community issue as well as you would expect. So in summary, I think that the, uh, co the various pinch points and constrictions we've had along the way are opening up a bit, and we're trying to, in response, increase the number of uh, personnel to do it. And as, as I just sketched out to you, we, that's almost a thousand, between 523 um, uh, military personnel on, on orders. Now, they, we won't have them for a long time, but we'll have them for a little while. And 400 more, we've almost increased 1,000 and that uh, personnel in the state to manage this. Well, thank, thank you, you, Secretary. Please. Other questions? Um, hi, this is Celia with the Kansas News Service. I wonder whether the, um, the phase in the two week periods for the phase in um, might be uh, whether they're a little fast or not, given that if I understand correctly with the incubation period and how long it takes for people to get sick enough to end up hospitalized, that usually is like a three week process. Secretary Norman and, and Dana could probably answer a little bit of that. Um, let's start with Dana about the, how the virus acts and, and its communicability and how long does it take folks to get sick? Yeah, certainly we have said um, that an incubation period, you, if you become, uh, if you have uh, infection with the virus, that around two to 14 days, um, you'll become symptomatic. So by two days, probably 2% will, uh, will have symptoms. That's a very small amount. But by uh, 11 or 12 days, probably 98% of the people that are going to have symptoms will have symptoms. So that's why the two weeks is there for the incubation period. But certainly we know that once you do have symptoms, many times um, you can feel better but then seven to 10 days later, you can probably have your immune dysregulation, the cytokine storm, and that's what can lead to the ARDS or the respiratory distress that you see. So certainly, um, as far as the, the dates go, uh, you're correct on that um, from the best knowledge that we have. And again, that's gonna be a majority of the cases, but certainly um, there can be other courses, but, but those are why um, you know, we have the two to 14 days, but then yes, after you have symptoms, Maybe seven to ten days later is when you can see this this really bad inflammatory process. But well, we do know that that's it's kind of on average, and so people will start to right. peak sooner than that. I think as a result of it, and you're in, and you're watching those, uh, and you're seeing more positive tests, Secretary Norman, we'll know at a two week period kind of how we're doing on a curve. Yeah, we will. And one of the things that we are finding to be the most helpful is. Uh, a, a charting out when do people uh, that become uh, positive cases, when do they begin their symptoms? Because, uh, you know, sometimes the local health departments or the commercial labs don't report positive tests to us right away or there's batch reporting and they'll come in peaks and valleys. But if you look at the when symptoms start, um, there's a very good trend line and that's what we are feeling comfortable about. Celia, to your question of me, or I guess of the plan, um, there's the plan, one of the, I think the strengths of the plan, uh, the framework is that it's flexible and it's, it's looking at each of the phases in two week in increments to mostly to help people forecast what they wanna do with their businesses and their lives. Uh, it's flexible enough that um, it won't be any shorter, each phase will not be any shorter than that, but it could be stretched out if it just hasn't, doesn't play out as optimistically as we think it, it will and, and think it could. 
And Thank the counties you. have a considerable amount of control, too. Um, you know, the, the counties are so diverse in the state that it, it would be a mistake to pull in from, you know, Thomas County out in Colby area. It would be a mistake to pull the reins in on them, and they're not really having much in the way or, or any problems there because somebody in southeast Kansas has a problem. So that's why we're trying to build some flexibility and local determination in there. But it's flexible enough that it can be extended if need be. Right. I think the, 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 the governor can change the plan, as she says, at each, at, at each at the time of, of those phases. And the second point being that it's, a, it's, a, it's the floor. Uh, people can have stricter precautions, as both John, John, Johnson and Wyandotte appear to be doing um, with a May 11th date as opposed to a May 4th date. So I think that uh, there is flexibility. And I think it medically it makes sense and about the phased reopening and it's cautious and um, and I, I believe it's a, it's optimistic which is a good thing um, and during the, this time and, and and we can certainly uh, respond to that. The other remember the other reason the the sheltering in place really did two things: a it kept people safe, but b it allowed us to prepare both um, for a surge that we didn't really have, the overwhelming surge, but it also helped us build up our supplies, our PPE, our testing kits and things like that. We are so much better off today because of that than we were before. Can't keep society closed forever. So uh, next question. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Jackson Overstreet with Cake News down in Wichita. I had a question for the doctors. Um, I know we're, we're phasing in kind of steps of reopening the state, reopening the economy, but what things should we take from what we're doing right now and continue it beyond these phases and even on to the months and months after this until next year? What are some of the things that we need to keep doing uh, to either fight this virus or just kind of would be good health practices to keep doing? You bet. And, and bless you for asking that question to give us the opportunity to go on about that. So, um, you know, yeah, it's all about the things, you know, right? If you wash your hands, you keep your distance, don't wipe your, don't, don't touch your face and, and cough into your elbow and don't go to work if you're sick. I think Secretary Norman made a reference a little while ago about the folks in these meatpacking plants. If you get sick, don't go. Well, that's not just true for the meatpacking plants. That's true for all of us. And for some of us, that's really hard. You know, physicians are kind of a funny breed. We're a little, we're a little goofy sometimes. And sometimes we're, we can be a little aloof. But, but the, the, the truth is that most physicians tend to go to work whenever they're sick. And that, we, we have to set a new story about that. And we have to ask everybody to do that. You have to wash your hands. And it's got to be that 20-second thing. You know, you could sing happy birthday to yourself uh, twice. I said a long time ago that if I had, uh, if I had uh, aged by a year, every time I sang the happy birthday song, I would be a millennium older right now. And, and now it's, that was like a month ago. So Lord knows how old I am today. Then um, really not touching your face because we know that that transfers it from whatever else you've had up to your face, and that's where it starts to get into your mouth, your nose, and that's when you start to get the infection going. And then that social distancing. You know, that's really tricky. I, I, I tell the story when I go. I go to the grocery store every morning on, or every week on Saturday to get the week's supplies. And, um, and last week I even ventured out to Home Depot. And those are all places I like to go. And I, I, I think that you have to be really conscious of how you're acting in public. Those things aren't going to go away. They're not going to change. Wearing a mask in public, that is not going to change until we have um, uh, Dana, an effective vaccine or effective therapy. And you wish there was some magic point. You wish you could say it differently. You wish you could find some snazzy, cool new way to dress this up. But the reality is it's the same thing. And we're just going to be with that reality for a long time. And just to say, that reality will really protect you from COVID-19. And we know that it's true because sheltering at home has clearly worked. But what did sheltering at home really do? What did it really do? It accomplished social distancing. That becomes one of the most important things you can do, Dana. Absolutely, it's gonna be these remedial things that we're saying every day that are so important, the pillars of, of staying healthy and helping stop the spread. It's the physical distancing, it's the hand washing, not touching your face, all those types of things, because we do need to get out to society and the economy needs to pick up and we need to do all those things, but individually, we can do all these things to stop and keep ourselves safe and keep other ones safe as well. All right, next question. Please. Please. Go ahead, Secretary. Oh, if I may add just one more uh, dimension to that. I think the new norm is going to profoundly change the work setting as well. 
and construction for that matter. Air handling, I think they're going to look a lot more at how many exchanges of air and if it's a negative pressure. Uh, I didn't realize there's a term out there called benching, meaning people working have, it's been all kind of uh, high tech and hip to like with Google and Facebook and whatnot uh, leading the way that you do away with offices. Sprint has done this, done away with offices and have people working in large common areas on common benches. That's going to go away. Handshakes, I think almost might be a thing of the past uh, for better, or for worse. Telework, I think we're discovering all sorts of ways to telework. I think it's going to put pressure on IT industries in a good way to have different kind of opportunities to do that. And, it, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see flexible scheduling, break room change. I think it's and all these are about uh, the social distancing and and, uh, and in the fundamentals that Dr. Hawkinson and, and uh, Stites just mentioned. But I, I think there'll be profound interest in uh, industrial hygiene and what is it that we need to do at work settings. Yeah, I think that's totally Dr. true. Norman, Terry Moran, how can you pick away handshakes? What am I going to do? You're getting close. Well, to you're gonna. You won't give a high five. You'll give a high elbow. There you go. All right, I can learn. Yeah, yeah, and and, and Dr. Hawkins had just mentioned no more kissing babies, so we have to be careful with that one too. But you know, the, the world when when we get effective therapy, or we get something that can help prevent the disease or treat the disease. It may change a little bit, but the, the reality is that these infection control practices will help you stay healthier, not just against coronavirus, but against influenza and metanumavirus and RSV and all the, you know, I'm a bad virus viruses. And, and, and those are the things that, the basic things that really, really work. Dana. Yeah. And I would like to add, and certainly Dr. Norman, please add any comments. You know, there's been some other information going around on the internet. These things are going to decrease your immune system. They're not going to make you as healthy. That's absolutely not true. There's no medical basis for that. There's no medical basis for being um, hygienic, for having good hand hygiene, and that's going to decrease your immune system. You yeah. still have bacteria on your body, just not on your hands. You still have um, environmental sources of, of antigens that are blowing in the air, either it's dust or pollen, or even uh, locally around here, we have a lot of fungus that are just in the air. We are exposed to environmentally in our lungs, and Dr. Stites can speak to that. Being clean and doing these hygienic practices is not going to lower your immune system. Yeah, that, uh, we saw some reports out of that from a couple of physicians out in California, and you just shake your head and say, gosh, some people will just say anything, yeah. right? Just anything, especially if they're financially motivated. Okay, other questions? Hi, this is a question for uh, Senator Moran regarding the PPP program. Um, yes, sir. Senator, you, uh, right from the start, you, you touted the program and um, – uh, one thing I just wanted to ask you about is there has been some concern about accountability within the program. One of your Kansas colleagues, Sharice Davids, sent a letter to Treasury about that yesterday. Um, as you've seen reports about companies that maybe weren't intended um, to to receive the loans or members of Congress receiving the loans, uh, I just want to get your thoughts on that and about whether or not the SBA should re release a comprehensive list of companies that have received PPP? Well, never can we uh, not have concerns about abuse of a government program. Um, I, and I suppose there is an issue here about what Congress intended and what the law allows. Uh, you want the result to be what Congress intended, but it's also hard to punish people who did not break a law. There needs to be oversight. I'm all in favor of a uh, review of the, of the program. I uh, support the idea of a release of information about recipients. Uh, public tax dollars require public uh, knowledge. Uh, and so, yes, uh, greater oversight. I've had this conversation with a couple of my colleagues with uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and they have indicated that in their work with SBA that more oversight and certainly uh, perhaps more uh, publication of uh, companies that uh, at least the belief is should not have acquired the, the dollars under the program and uh, are being uh, encouraged and are returning their loans. Not all, but, but many. Uh, so more accountability is, is uh, certainly something I support and uh, public knowledge of the program and its recipients uh, is beneficial. I would say, and this, I, I would never want to, to be the defender of, of problems within government, but a challenge occurs uh, is there because the, the 
rapidity, the, the quickness with which a Congress and the SBA uh, moved. Congress doesn't do its job uh, well, uh, even when we're methodical. Uh, and here, the work in the nation's capital was done in a matter of days. Um, now, we chose a program that I mean, it used an agency that already existed, the SBA, uh, trying to not reinvent uh, the, the, the wheel. But we also asked the Small Business Administration to administer uh, $350 billion of loans uh, in two weeks. Uh, for It's an agency that deals with $30 billion in a year. So there are going to be instances, I, I just I want to be straightforward with Kansans, that there will be instances in which we shake our heads, uh, we're shocked that this is something that should not have happened, uh, and we will work to correct those. But I would expect them to occur based upon the quickness with which Congress and the, and the SBA was required to act. I thought and b believe still today that every day that went by in which we didn't have a program that assisted small business uh, meant that there would be more and more people unemployed in Kansas and across the country. And in fact, as we were debating the PPP program in Congress, and I was calling people in Kansas and talking to business owners, the conversation in many instances was, I am so glad that you called me today because I just was going through the process of figuring out who to furlough I'm going to hang on to my employees to wait to see what Congress gets done. And the reports from, from businesses across our state uh, have been uh, very positive, as well as uh, reports from employees being retained on the payroll. So uh, there's there no question but what greater oversight is positive, no question but what greater transparency is necessary, uh, and no question but what we will continue to see these things that are very uh, troublesome uh, as this program, uh, as, as those things happen. Just interject for a moment because uh, I think Secretary Norman had to jump to his incident command call. I do want to reach out and say thank you to, to Lee. Uh, we've known Lee for a long time here at KU and, and so appreciate his great work as Secretary of KDHE and, and how hard he and how much time he has put in on this and trying to help keep Kansas safe and get us uh, and I said, work with the governor's office and others to do modeling and getting the swabs out there and getting things stood up, et cetera. It's, it's just been terrific. Thank you. So um, other questions out there for uh, Senator Moran or for our, our studio? I wonder how, how quickly um, KU will ramp up non-emergency, you know, quote unquote, uh, elective care again. Does that happen really fast now? Or are you going to wait a little longer before you schedule that? You know, it's a, that is a great question. And, and we'll... Um, yeah. So first of all, what is elective in one person's eyes may not be elective in another person's eyes. Um, what we had done is those things didn't require that needing to be done for life-saving reasons, like you had to have a heart bypass. We well, got to get that done. Cancer surgery, you got to get that done. Um, but like hip replacements and knee replacements and 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 other types of operations or or revisions of of prior surgeries, et cetera, we had delayed those. Um, because we didn't have enough PPE and we had to build all that up. And I think we've been successful with the help of, of, of a lot of organizations and our whole supply chain folks um, and a lot of donors from the outside just to, to, to give a shout out. You know, we've started some of those cases uh, already. Um, they are not truly elective. They just weren't emergent. And so we've started doing those cases. Purely elective cases, and, and if you think about what is a purely elective case, is it, you know, I, I, I have sometimes have a little saggy chin right there, and I want to get that correct. That's, that's, a, that's an elective case. And, and so things of that nature, we're still kind of, kind of have on the back burner, and we're, we're not going that direction. But we have started doing other surgeries that we think are important for patients to get done, and part of our reason was a medical one. The prevalence of the disease right now is lower than it's going to be as society opens back up again. We have fewer COVID patients in the hospital. So as a result, we thought like this was a really safe time to have people come back. As we bring people back, though, we're doing a lot of things to make sure they stay safe. Um, one of the things we're doing is that patients before surgery have a COVID test because we know that people post-op after if they've had COVID and they were asymptomatic, 
or symptomatic, but you know, asymptomatic are the ones you're concerned about. If they have surgery, there's a lot of good data out there that says they don't do very well. So we don't want that to happen. So everybody gets a COVID test before surgery. The second thing is we have a whole process for keeping people safe, making sure the room in the OR is safe, making sure we turn the arrow. Usually we could turn a room from one patient to the next by about 30 minutes. Now it takes us an hour and a half to clean the room, disinfect the room, and change the air in the room. And so there's so much that has gone on to redesigning the workflow. And what we know is this. As health systems begin to reopen across the country, they will not look the same. You will not have the same kind of ambulatory visit you had before. Part of it is because the people in the room with you, including your physician and provider, are going to have face masks on. You're going to have a face mask on. We're going to take your temperature when you come in the room or when you come in the building. And we're, we've designed the process so you don't spend a lot of time at all in the waiting room or at the front desk. You really kind of go right into the room. And when you're done, you kind of get right out of the room because we want people to not have to come in contact with a lot of other folks uh, in, in, in an office environment. And the doors you come into our ambulatory building are not the doors you go out. So we've really tried to change our whole workflow and done it on the fly. And telemedicine is here to stay. And that is a great thing and will help extend care to all of Kansas and all of our region. So I, I you know, you got to find the silver lining in hard times, right? If you, just, if you just look at all the bad things, you just get overwhelmed. But if you say, what are the good things that are coming come out of this? Well, I think folks have spent a lot more time with their families. I think there have been things in bonds about how to create social uh, uh, connection through the internet that have really been a great outcome from this. And from a healthcare perspective, changing our workflows to make sure people are safe, that's probably a really good thing. Telemedicine, you know what? That is a game changer. And it's going to change healthcare delivery, especially in underserved areas, dramatically. So those are the things we're doing to keep people safe. We've already started doing more surgeries. We're having more ambulatory visits. And that will be a slow, gradual process as we re rebuild that volume. And most of all, we keep our patients and our providers and our staff safe while we do it. That is first and foremost for us and uh, uh, how we approach it. Dr. Stein, could you address, um, you've talked before about um, a, a, um, decreasing the amount of time it gets test results. Um, how are you all doing in terms of processing the tests at the hospital and, and getting the tests in a timely fashion, or the results? Yeah, you bet. So um, what, what happens is the test has to come to us. We have to make sure the swab's good quality. We do quality control measures. Then we put it on the machine. The machine now takes about three or four hours. So we can turn around tests around six to eight hours because there's a process in front of it and a process at the end to make sure that everything, the quality is right. And that's why we have an incredibly high sensitivity and specificity for these tests. They do a really good job in our lab and they work really hard at making sure those results are good. So, you know, for one point, when we were really overwhelmed early and nobody had testing kits, it was four or five days. Now it's a matter of hours that we get it back and, and uh, we do three or four runs a day in, in different areas. Dave, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and our turnaround time, we're able to do those uh, perioperative, those pre-op testing for you if you're going to have a procedure to make sure that you don't have it to in so that you don't increase your risk afterward for problems. So certainly our testing capacity has improved. The turnaround time has improved. Um, so far, our um, our testing supplies have improved as well. So as far as the supply chain was mentioned before. So right now, it, it, everything is going pretty good. And hopefully yeah. we don't run into a surge or crunch. But we're doing really well now as far as turnaround time for testing results. So I think we probably have time for about one more question. Anyone else out there, especially one for Senator Moran? Sir, I had a question I wanted to follow up yesterday uh, on the secondhand smoke question. Were you able to find out anything more about what the virus uh, in secondhand smoke? Dana? Yeah, I haven't found any um, out of a lot of uh, literature review and journal articles. There is really nothing on specifically about um, 
secondhand smoke and the virus being carried on, on secondhand yeah, smoke. Yeah, and, and so. remember that all of those uh, things like smoke, um, and this is not an advertisement They're for toxic. smoking, they are toxic, and so they'll probably help kill the virus. That doesn't mean that smoking is a good idea to kill the virus, quite the opposite. Right. Smoking lowers your host immunity and causes lung damage, which will enable the virus to, to, to I mean, we know that people with uh, COPD and emphysema or asthma are much higher risks and uh, uh, for bad outcomes. And if, I think if you're thinking about expelling you know, you're not going to expel out any less virus than if you coughed or sneeze if you're yeah. secondhand. I tried to do well. some looks too, and I don't know that that specific question yeah. has been addressed. But I, you know, there is some intuitive thinking, and after 40 years as a well, 30 years as a pulmonologist, um, I, 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 I have this kind of thing that smoking is always bad, right. and it never gets good under any circumstance. And vaping. And vaping, same story. Yeah, vaping. Yeah. Next questions. Well, one more. Yeah, this is a question for uh, the senator. You mentioned you were going back to Washington on Monday. Just what are some things that Kansas residents can look forward to as far as what's going to be happening on Capitol Hill with some of these, uh, with either some coronavirus response or other bills? Well, um, a couple of things uh, related to COVID virus, the COVID-19 virus, uh, a a couple of hearings will occur this week. Uh, one uh, involves the Commerce Committee, of which I'm a member, looking at uh, the COVID response by the airlines uh, and the response by the federal government and assistance of airlines and airports. Uh, an effort to try to make certain that flying is safer. As the doctor said, we probably don't return to things that are normal. So what have the airlines done to uh, alter the, the, the uh, circumstances when you're, when you're on board a plane and getting aboard a plane? And also, how's the financial efforts to try to keep airplanes and airports viable, uh, airlines and airports viable? How is it working? Uh, in, a, in a broader sense, I think this begins the uh, discussion. I started to say one-on-one, -on -one, but that will not occur. The social distancing is still uh, required. Uh, staff is absent from uh, our offices in most instances. But the conversations that what does phase four uh, what's the next response to the virus uh, by Congress? So uh, specific kinds of hearings uh, and opportunities for us to see how things are working, uh, somewhat related to the conversation that I had with the Kansas City Star earlier. Uh, what are the problems that need to be fixed? What are the abuses that need to be addressed? Uh, but then more broadly, what are the next steps that uh, Congress and the administration will consider uh, as we try to respond to this uh, continuing challenge of COVID-19 virus economically and healthcare. It will give me a chance to continue the efforts to talk to, um, again, not one-on-one, -on -one, but the chance to, to have the opportunity to talk to people, my colleagues, and find out successes or failures that they've had in uh, accessing more tests or more PPE. So uh, just um, a, a bit of getting back to work uh, somewhat gradually, just like the phases of um, of what Kansas is proposing, I would uh, expect uh, the Congress to move in kind of slow phases as we get ourselves back accustomed to a, a new parameters for work in Washington D.C. And I'll just say, Senator, this is my uh, this is my personal relentless plug, um, working, helping us work, and making sure that we can get things done both nationally and internationally to work on that vaccine, trying to get down any barriers we can to, to get that thing promoted, because that's going to be, well, that's a game changer, I think. So, and I, and I know that you know that, so. Um, uh, thank, thank you for the reminder. reminder. Is, you know, why we talk about testing, testing so often is that testing is important. It's, it, it becomes, I, I shouldn't say it that way. Testing is important now, and certainly it's important because we do not have a, a vaccine. Uh, the last set, the, the last appropriation bill, the, what I'm calling phase 3.5, included uh, $25 billion for additional uh, testing and research into the virus, $8 billion. And we've seen uh, the co cooperation now of NIH and others in a consortium of public and private uh, research facilities to try to find that virus, uh, to try to find that vaccine for the virus. And at least press reports, doctors, uh, indicate that uh, some progress, maybe more than was expected, uh, has Thanks. occurred.
I think it's I think it's actually in, much more encouraging than it was even a month ago. So, Senator, I want to thank you for all the service you give and for your time here on Friday mornings. It is always a pleasure to have you on the program and your great efforts on behalf of the state of Kansas and and for all of us. Uh, it, it is a real pleasure. Dr. Hawkins, any final thoughts? Dr. Today? Thank you for letting me. Doctors, thank you for letting me join you. I leave you to visit with an eighth grade class. Uh, any advice that you want me to give uh, to a set of middle school students this morning? Dana, you have young kids. Pick your head up from your phones. <laughs> Pick your head up from the phone. That's pretty good. I don't think I can do better than that. I was going to say, make sure you wash your hands. I have a seventh grade uh, son, so that's the main goal. At least wash the phone. Wash it. Clean it. There you go. But I would like to say... <laughs> um, you know, and Dr. Norton mentioned this, all of our counties are, are independent and strong, um, but we haven't been provincial in the way that we are treating this disease. We have collaborated with the rest of Kansas and other counties um, as a unit to help um, really stop the spread of this infection and make sure that our health care systems are not overwhelmed. And I'll just say, remember Kansas and Western Missouri and anybody else out there, you bent the curve by following the guidelines and doing the rules. Those don't change. Even as you start to go back out there, don't bend the curve back. Just remember, even now, even as we reopen, there's still no place like home. On Monday, we are joined by Joe Reardon, who is the president of the Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, as well as Tammy Peterman and Bob Page, president of the campus and CEO of our health system, to have a talk about reopening in business and how all that intersection occurs with healthcare and how health, health systems are going to reopen. So we look forward to that conversation. Until then, stay safe.